Um, my particular focus is on the African presence in early New England. So I was especially intrigued by the Jacqueline family, Isaac Jacqueline, Mercy Chagum, and their descendants. A lot of um, branches of the Chagum family have traced their genealogy, but to my knowledge, the Jacqueline genealogy has not really been connected all the way back to the lighthouse. Um, next slide, please. Now, we know from Village of Outcasts that the Jacklins left the lighthouse early in the 19th century, 1804. Isaac Jacklin purchased land in Winchester in an area called Danbury Quarter. Um, and this dot here represents a spot about 20 miles south of Winchester. I don't know why the dot moved, but um, Winchester, just a little bit west of here. Um, and close to Bark Hampstead, a half a dozen miles uh, along Route 44. Um, the next slide, please. Now, the lighthouse, um, as a sort of multi-ethnic outsider community, oddly enough, seems to have been tied into a lot of other um, similar multi-ethnic and similarly kind of outsider communities. Um, Ryan Huey created this map. Here we are at the lighthouse. Over here, another similar community uh, about five miles down the river in New Hartford. And then a little ways out 44, the Danbury Quarter community. And they all seem to be connected uh, socially and even genealogically between all three communities and probably lots more. Um, and through a combination of uh, Documentary research, some excavation, and um, some speculation. We found um, relationships that tie the people together and are looking at Danbury Quarter as a long duration, several generations duration community that can serve as a paradigm, really, for the effects of um, changes in society, industrialization on communities like this. Next slide, please. Danbury Quarter is the northwestern corner of Winchester. It was the third and final division of lands in the town of Winchester. Uh, it was laid out in 1763, um, not extensively settled for about a decade after that. The community was called Danbury Quarter because some of the earliest residents, the Andrews family and the Benedict family, both uh, Euro-American, moved from Danbury into this section. Um, it is right alongside of Winchester Center, which was the 18th century hub of the town. In um, the 19th century, the hub moved to Winstead, a little further east. Um, and the area got sort of abandoned during the Great Exodus, they call it. Uh, Western New York opened up to white settlement, and between 1800 and 1810, a good 75% probably of the white population moved out to Western New York, which was um, not unheard of in that time for entire communities to move away together, uh, as strange as it seems to us now. But around that time is when the shift comes in Danbury Quarter from being this kind of um, not very successful white farming community, which moves away and black families start moving in and purchasing land and developing uh, a community starting, we think starting in 1804 with Isaac Jackman's purchase of land. Next slide, please. By 1820, um, a pretty sizable African-American community had developed around the Jackman property, um, literally around, geographically around. This is Danbury Quarter Road here, present day Danbury Quarter Road. This along here is Skinner Road, which comes up, dead ends after a while, and then coming down from um, Colebrook, comes in as Flag Hill Road. At one point, it went all the way through. This is the 1934 aerial survey. You can still kind of see the road sort of going through. Now, the Jacqueline property was on what is now 
Skinner Day Road, but in a section that's been abandoned after the dead end. Um, it moves all the way back up to um, the 44 that comes after it comes across, becomes Flykill Road, comes back out to 44 again, so it makes a kind of a, a cut across land. Next slide. Now, we probably met the Jacklins in Village of Outcasts, but uh, here's a little quick synopsis. Um, Isaac Jacklin was free African-American, purchased land at the lighthouse in the 1780s, and soon thereafter he married James Chogham and Molly Barber's daughter, Mercy Chogham. We don't know exactly where he was from. He might have been from Hartford. That's the generally accepted story that he was a servant of uh, Secretary Willis in Hartford. Um, that story's been for a long time. But nobody's actually made that genealogical connection. Uh, he could have been from New London area. He could have been from other place in Litchfield County. He could have been from Dutchess County, New York. Or he could have been from New York City. There are African-American Jacqueline families in all these places. Um, like I said, I haven't been able to, and nobody to my knowledge has been able to tie this all together. You're all invited to join in the search. It's a lot of fun. Um, at any rate, Isaac and Jacqueline, Isaac Jacqueline and Mercy Jacqueline moved away from the lighthouse <coughs> came to Danbury Quarter about 1804, and at least four generations of their family lived in this area. They had a number of children. Um, they lived out their lives. Isaac and Mercy lived out their lives there. They're probably buried in the Danbury Quarter Cemetery. Um, at some point, the road was cut off, but before that, their grandson Isaac lived over the line in Colebrook, on the same road, so it can be reasonably assumed to be part of the community. And over the next couple of generations, um, a larger community grew up around. So Skinner Road was closed off at the end, old houses disappeared, and 20th century houses have been built since then. Can we have the next slide? Um, future generations. The oldest son of Isaac and Mercy was John Jacklin. He inherited the house after his parents passed, and he married Hannah Wallace, who was the daughter of London Wallace, who was from the African-American community in New Hartford, Connecticut. So now we've made a genealogical connection between all three of the communities. This is evidence of contact, uh, social bonds between the children. Um, in this family. They were gone from the lighthouse, but they were still part of the lighthouse family and the New Hartford family as well. Um, John and Hannah had several children uh, who have not all been traced. Son Isaac owned the Flag Hill Road property in Colebrook. Emmeline married Noah Barber, and they lived on the Jacqueline property for quite a while. Um, we don't know anything about their son. I don't know anything about their son, Isaac. Samuel Jacklin, by the 1890s, was designated of Pennsylvania or elsewhere. Um, and there are several Samuel Jacklins in Pennsylvania who are traceable through census records. The interesting thing is they are all listed as white people. Lyman Jacklin died age 13, and he's buried with John and Hannah in the Danbury Quarter Cemetery. Now, Isaac and Mercy, um, I think that is the next slide, please. Isaac and Mercy's daughter, Sarah, who is also called Sally, um, married Stephen Elwell. Her cousin, Polly, at the lighthouse, also married an Elwell. Um, this was the brother of Stephen Elwell that Sally married. And Sally and Stephen lived in Danbury Quarter in her father's house in 1820. But by 1830, they had moved back to the lighthouse. They were still there in 1850 with their adult son, Curtis. Um, and then Sarah is untraceable after that. 
Stephen L. Well died in Barkhampstead in 1859. Curtis moved back to Winchester by 1870. He never married, and no children are apparent. Their only other child died at the age of two in 1822. So the line, apparently, that line genealogically comes to an end, but the tie back to Bark Hampstead in the 1830s, and then back again to Winchester 20 years later with their son Curtis Elwell, is evidence of continuing ties. That these communities, rather than being isolated, were actually all within a social network, um, were maintaining family relationships, and were making the effort to continue as much as they could um, as a genealogical and social community. Next slide, please. Um, Denver Quarter in the 19th century, like um, the Lighthouse in the 18th and 19th century, was a multicultural community, multi-ethnic, and in a funny way, the census kind of bears this out. Um, Isaac Jacqueline seemed to be the first black landowner in Danbury Quarter. But at 1810, the whole Jacqueline family are listed as all other free persons, um, census code for black. In 1820, they're all white. In 1830, they're back to being colored. And in 1840, they're white again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's going on here? A lot of possibilities. Possibly race is absolutely fluid, and there is no real distinction you can make. Um, one of the other things that can happen is we know that Native people, Black people, and Anglo people were marrying Jacqueline family members. Maybe this is the census taker coming to the door. Someone opens the door that they identify as white or black or other or whatever. And rather than saying, oh, by the way, is your wife and everyone else in the house black? Uh, just assumes that the person who opened the door is proxy for the entire family. Um, not really a knowable thing now, a couple hundred years later, but it is kind of interesting and it does show the fluidity and the uh, instability of a concept like race. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, well, by 1830, federal census shows at least a good half a dozen families living all around each other at Danbury Quarter. Um, Jacqueline family, Watermans, the Wallaces, who may or may not be genealogically related to Hannah Wallace. That's another Hannah Wallace, the wife of uh, Isaac and Mercy's son, John. That has not been discovered yet. Could be, though. Orange Gardner, um, female household, female-headed household ranging from a toddler child to a woman allegedly 100 years old. Very interesting. The Hazard family and the Dolphin family, a family of six. Um, Let's have the next slide, which talks a little about the Dolphin family. Richard and Sophronia Dolphin moved back and forth between Danbury Quarter and the Lighthouse. Richard Dolphin is consistently listed as black. His wife is listed as white. His family, the children, six children, are usually designated M for mulatto, um, though in later years, they turn white, too. Um, their genealogical collection, connection sorry, to any of the other families isn't known, but they're at the Lighthouse, they're at Danbury Quarter, and back and forth. Um, in further generations, the children do move back to Winchester. Um, again, connection, but the character of it is uh, not yet known. Um, eventually, 
Richard Dolphin Jr. and a couple of the siblings are living with the James Wallace family's son Giles. So these are children that perhaps grew up together in Winchester. Dolphin family moved away, Dolphin family moved back and reconnected with their either old community members or perhaps relatives. Next slide, please. Now, the Danbury Quarter Cemetery. There is a cemetery at Danbury Quarter. It's rather hard to reach. Danbury Quarter is not an easy um, community to walk into. It's not been um, recognized and given the, um, the status it deserves, like the lighthouse. And the cemetery there is um, kind of hard to get to. You have to get permission, you have to get a Jeep, and you have to get some hiking boots. And you have to make sure the weather's perfect and uh, everything else. It hasn't rained in a couple of months or whatever. And you can get into the cemetery, but it's mostly in really bad shape. This is what most of the stones in the cemetery look like. <coughs> um, it gets vandalized kind of a lot. Every now and then there's a movement to stop the vandalism. But unfortunately, uh, it's too late for quite a few of the stones. The uh, Hale Collection noted 60 legible stones in the early 1930s. The earliest one was dated 1805, and the newest one was dated 1893. Of the legible stones, relatively few families were represented. There were maybe 10 families in total. Next slide, please. But three of the stones, happily, were from the Jacqueline family. Lyman Jacqueline died 1838 as a child of 13. John Jacqueline died 1850. And his wife, Hannah Jacqueline, died 1869. We believe Isaac and Mercy were probably buried there, but have not been able to document it. And we've been to the cemetery several years ago. Um, it was mapped, uh, which unfortunately I could not add into a PowerPoint. Um, but the cemetery being mapped, um, it gave a nice distribution of the graves that were left. But many of the graves are unmarked even by the little um, broken stones. Many of them are simply depressions in the ground and uh, relatively less informative than we would like. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, um, none of the, oh, by the way, on the cemetery, none of the other family names from Danbury Quarter, the Wallaces, the Watermans, Dolphins and Gardeners, none of their stones survived to make it into the Hale inscriptions, unfortunately. Um, and it looks like this community broke apart probably about the same time that the lighthouse did, and uh, maybe for some of the same reasons. Um, so, why is this archaeology when we have not put Trowel 1 into the ground? Uh, about eight years ago, we started the process looking for permission to dig on the Jackman property, and our search went about <coughs> this far and then fizzled. Probably we will never be able to excavate there. Um, our only hope at this point is to get good documentary research um, and genealogical research. It's not the ground truth, but it's laid a foundation. Uh, it's helped us formulate some relevant questions and put the Jacklins and their family and community in the context of social movements in the 19th century. We've been able to document birth growth transformation of, of people, of communities. Uh, we've, we've got a settlement pattern. We've got an actual settlement pattern and movement between communities. Uh, social mobility, geographic mobility. And it's put out larger concepts like, like the construction of race. We've got a family here that are black and white and black 
and wait simultaneously and alternately. And um, this offers us the opportunity to ask what race means and what race means archaeologically and how this will be reflected archaeologically when sometime in the future we actually, hopefully, do get out there, do excavate on some of the properties, at least map and document as best we can. So, yeah, um, we call this archaeology until we can do the part that we all live for, the actual getting out there and mapping and digging. And uh, this is my introduction to the Jacklins. I hope that uh, someday we'll be able to tell you.